Happy Sabbath. We are so glad that you are joining us for worship. And also, as we always do, we kick off our worship service with some things that are happening in the life of the Loma Linda University Church. And we have a couple of great programs that are just around the corner, Sue. Next week at 4.30, right here in the sanctuary is our annual Winnegar Awards. Pastor John Brunt will be speaking. He is well known in this community. Also the Wedgwood Trio, and there's much more than that. You can go to our website for more details, but put on your calendar next week, 4.30, right here in the sanctuary. On February the 25th at seven o'clock, we wanna invite you out to another fresh picked improv. This is Scotty Ray and his team. They're hilarious, very talented. It'll be a night of fun over at Crosswalk Church. Again, that is at seven o'clock, fresh picked improv. We'll see you there. And next, our senior ministry has a trip planned for the Griffith Observatory. It's this week, Thursday. They'll be leaving at 1.30 if you'd love to go to that call the church office, but it's leaving this Thursday at 1.30, a senior ministry trip to the Griffith Observatory. We wanna invite you to go on a mission trip this summer in July. It'll be July the 4th through the 18th. You Reach is putting this trip together. They're going to Kenya, to the Mara. There's gonna be construction, medical work. And I have been before, it's been a little bit of time, but it is an amazing experience and I highly recommend it and encourage you to go. If you would like to go, there are lots of details on our website. Again, the dates, all of the information that you will need to make a decision about that, you will need to register. So I just encourage you, get outside of your own world and the world here in the US and go do an international mission trip to Kenya. Shauna Campbell, our children's ministry pastor, has a very special event for those single mothers out there. Here, take a look. We have something exciting to share with you. Children's Ministries is partnering with Anthem to start a single mom's brunch coming up on February 26th at 10.30 a.m. I hope you will consider joining us if you are a single mom. You will have your car detailed as you enjoy a beautiful brunch, but better than that, you will connect with other single moms and you can share experiences. We hope you will come and make sure to sign up. It is free, but we do need you to register. We hope to to see you there. We have a seminar that is starting back up. Some of you may have taken it previously, but this is a financial piece. It's with Dave Ramsey. We like to have opportunities for you to grow and dig deeper as a disciple of Christ. And part of that is being a good steward of your money. So mark your calendars, March the 7th. It'll be Tuesday evenings. If you want more information, go on our website. You'll need to register, but it will really be a good opportunity for you or maybe your spouse, a friend to learn more about financial stewardship. Come on out. Well, with that, that's our announcements for today. Yeah. For the latest information, as we always say, go to our website, lluc.org. We want to remind you not to forget about your Bible reading plan. It is February, we're two months into it. I'm not gonna ask you, Sue, about where you're at with it. But don't ask I'm me. I'm making progress. <laughs> okay. We hope that you have a wonderful Sabbath. We love you guys.
Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. We're so excited to have you here. We're genuinely happy that you are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary. I'd like to give a big shout out and welcome to not only our sanctuary choir, but our Belforza Bell Choir. They were fantastic. We are blessed under the directorship of Celia Chan. Thank you, Celia. We love having you here and we love all the music in Loma Linda University Church. Well, friends, it's, um, it's that season that the world enjoys and celebrates the love theme. It's February 12. It's only two days away from Valentine's Day. And I, I have to ask, gentlemen, how many of you have a plan? Raise them high. Raise your hand if you have a plan. Okay, I know that was delicate stuff because when you didn't raise your hand, that means we have a discussion. Sorry about that, but I'm just trying to prod you along. Uh, we talked about love in junior high Sabbath school. And uh, I want to say something that the junior high might say to you on the playground. I know someone who loves you. His name is Jesus Christ. He invented love and he adores you. Can I get an amen? So I would like to ask you to do something now. We're, we are a big church and the only way we can become more intimate is when we interact with one another and we have a moment to do this. Won't you get up and say hello to somebody that you have not said hello to for a while? Right now, come stand with me, and let's go say hello, and I want you to say this. Jesus loves you, my friend. Jesus loves you. Is there a better way to celebrate a season of love? It does my heart good to see people standing up and walking clear across the church, celebrating what we have in common with our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the pastors here at Loma Linda University Church, we care very much for one another, and we want so bad for our church community to find occasion to care for one another. Because the author of love is God and his son. And in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love never fails. Say that with me. Love never fails. God has put within us the capacity to love one another. But friends, he has given us the capacity during worship to return that love to him. And I hope in the next few moments, over the next hour, you have occasion to talk with him and to tell him, God, I love you. That's the true season and celebration of love. Won't you stand with me just now as we prepare to sing a wonderful love song back to our God as we worship our Lord and King.
In this church, we believe in discipleship. And we believe that that's done in different ways. And one of those days is one of those ways is through prayer. And so this morning, I want to invite you to join me as we call upon our God. But another way that we do that is also through outreach. And this morning, we're going to do something that we don't tend to do as we call for prayer. But we feel that it's important. And that's we want to invite you to remember our brothers and sisters in Turkey and in Syria. And one of the ways that you can do that is by giving. So we want to invite you to go to our church website, to the UReach website. And on there, you will find a way in which you can give towards water filters that they are in desperate need of at this moment. So we encourage you to go to our church website, our UReach website, and give in that way on top of praying for our brothers and sisters in Turkey. But this morning, as a church, we will also call upon the Lord so that he can bring these two countries comfort. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, your church comes today before you, Lord, pleading. We know that the enemy is hard at work, wanting to destroy our families, our children, our marriages, wanting to attack our peace of mind, Lord, our faith. And so we come to you asking for you to give us peace, for you to give us faith, Lord. We want to also ask in a special way this morning for our brothers and sisters, Lord, who have lost loved ones, who are missing loved ones. May you bring them comfort. May you give them hope. May you give them faith, Lord, as they go through this hard, hard time. We also want to give you our families. We want to give you our burdens. We want to give you our worries. And we want to ask that amidst all of it, Lord, you may shine through. May we feel your love. May we feel you embracing us. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Good morning, church, and uh, happy Sabbath to everyone. What a wonderful day to relax, to listen to beautiful music, and the word of God. Now is the time for uh, offering and tithe. We receive from God a lot. Of what we are returning is a small portion. Thank you, Jesus, for everything. I'm just going to read one for me, most beautiful verse in the Bible, my favorite, in the book of Romans, book of Romans, chapter 8, and verse 32. He, which refers to our God, 
creator, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for, all, for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Let us please bow our heads for the prayer. Oh Lord, you are an awesome God. You are a creator, sustainer, Lord of the lords, king of the kings. You bless us with your beloved son and our savior, Jesus Christ. What we are now, Lord, offering and giving is just a small portion. But thank you so much for blessing your church. Church of love. Church of courage. Church, a church that is willing to return to you. So, Lord, be with every one of us and bless us in this time. It's this time, in this time of end, when we are approaching your soon coming. Oh, Lord, what a day is going to be when you come to be forever and ever with you. We pray in your name. Amen.
It is now time for the children's story, which is very exciting. I'd like to invite all the children to come down, and as they do here at this church, we collect a lamb's offering. So if you would like to, please wave notes, coins, your whole person wallet, your phone. Children, as you come down, pick those things up. Feels a bit like a Charles Dickens novel, doesn't it? Pick it all up, children. Take it all. <laughs> Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you so much for your kindness in your giving. How can you not give to these kids? Really, just try. <laughs> this might be an inside secret, but these kids pick up a better offering than the deacons do, so... <laughs> Come on down, come on down. Oh, well done, well done. That's it. Put it in, then come have a seat up the front. I love it. It's so good. A church full of children. It's wonderful. Come have a seat up the front here. That's perfect, right there. That's exactly it. Oh, you have done well, young man. You have done very well. Well done. Well done. Come have a seat. Anywhere around here, anywhere on the steps. Thank you, everyone. Children in church, it's just precious. It really is. Okay, good spot, good spot. <laughs> As the last little bits of cash come in, let me tell you about the characters in this story. You'll need to pay careful attention. So today's story involves four characters, plus two more. The first one that we have is Tony the too tall tortoise? Hmm, that's right. He, he was a tortoise, but he was too tall. He was called Tony, so his friends called him Tony the too tall tortoise. The next character in this story is Beaufort, the bizarrely built butterfly with incredibly buff legs. Hmm, yeah. I might have made some trouble for myself as I go through this story. The next character in this story was uh, Mr. Mousy Mouse, who was in fact an elephant. Mm. And then lastly, we have the foul owl. Now, the foul owl was actually an owl, but he reminded everyone a lot of a chicken. And the word for a chicken is also a fowl, so they all called him the foul owl. Hmm. So, one day, these four characters, they got an invitation to a surprise birthday party. Oh, they were so excited. And they arrived early, and they walked into the room where this surprise birthday party was going to be. And there in this room, oh, there was a table, and near one of the seats was a giant cake. Oh, it looked so good. It was tall, and it was white with pink icing. Oh, made them very excited. As they were standing there in the room, uh, there was some music playing in the background. And they were kind of just milling around the room, having a chat with each other. Well, and then the music started to die down. And it was Beaufort, the bizarrely built butterfly, who first kind of made the shuffling moves towards sitting right beside the cake. Mm. But Mr. Mousy Mouse noticed as well and stuck his trunk out and walked a little bit faster. But the music wasn't stopping. It was just fading down from one song and into the next. So the music picked up again, and they all pretended like they hadn't been shuffling for the seat by the cake and they continued milling around the room until it happened a second time. When the music died down, oh, now this time, Tony the Too Tall Tortoise was involved in the shuffle as well, and they shuffled a little bit faster, but no, it was just the fade between one song and the next. 
After this went around a few times, they'd accidentally found themselves in a game of musical chairs, walking around the room, trying to get the seat right beside the cake. But then it happened. The music stopped. The race was on. Oh yeah, Beaufort, the bizarrely built butterfly, took off running. Woo! He didn't fly because he liked to run on his incredibly buff legs. Woo! He goes off running. <gasps> no one's going to be left behind. True tall Tony the tortoise takes off as well. Here he comes running up behind. The foul owl starts flapping and doing her best to get there. As she's flapping along, she starts clucking like a chicken, which just confirmed everyone's suspicions. Oh my goodness. And Mr. Mousy Mouse came thundering around the outside as well. They were running for the seat beside the cake. Woo! As they came around the last corner, Tony the two-tall tortoise out in front, he lost his footing, <sighs> went skidding off. Turns out he was faster in his shell than he was on his feet. He tucked his feet in and skidded along. Tony the two-tall tortoise came up behind Mr. Mousy Mouse, went under Mr. Mousy Mouse, and Mr. Mousy Mouse put one foot on him, and then two, and then three, and four. And Mr. Mousy Mouse, the elephant, found himself pirouetting Ah, down the side of the room, on top of two tall Tony the tortoise. Both of the butterfly and the fowl owl came in behind. They came up to this last seat. Ooh, guess what happened? They all leapt for the seat. And, well, they actually all ended up on the same seat. Yay! Just on top of each other. Ridiculous. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Mousy Mouse was still on top of two tall Tony the tortoise. But he was on top of the foul owl, and at the bottom of all of this was Beaufort, the bizarrely built butterfly, who thought, now is a great time to do some squats, because I've got some weight on my back. There he was, all in one chair beside the cake. And then the door opened. Guess who came in? It was Jesus. Yeah. Jesus opened the door, and with a kind of quizzical expression on his face, he said, hello. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> What's going on? We're here for the party. Jesus said, well, okay, good, good, good. Listen, we're just waiting for one more person to come to the party. And just as Jesus said that, well, the naked mole rat came in the door. You might remember him. He was our Sabbath school teacher from a few stories ago. He was kind of a humble creature and wasn't too fussy. He just walked in the door and found the closest seat to him and hopped up and put a smile on his face and said, happy birthday. And at this point, Jesus said, listen, actually, this surprise birthday party, it's for you, Mr. Mole Rat. And he's like, oh, yay. And then Jesus slid the cake from in front of that pile of animals <laughs> to the center of the table. The funny thing was, it was actually a round table anyway. And then without any condemnation, but just with a little bit of help, Jesus helped unpile all those four animals and sit them around the table. And there they celebrated and shared the birthday cake and had a fantastic little birthday party. Mm, it was fun. Uh, on other days, they threw uh, surprise birthday parties for the other animals, but today it was for Mr. Mole Rat. If you listen carefully to uh, today's sermon, you will hear Jesus telling a parable, very similar to this one, but with slightly different characters. Mm. Randy is going to be preaching about this upside-down kingdom that we live in, where we as Christians, if we go to a place and there are seats around a table, we offer the best seats first before taking them ourselves, because that's how we live as Christians. Does that make sense? Too easy. Thank you so much for listening to this absolutely ridiculous story. I'll let you go back to your seats.
We are continuing our sermon series, Insiders and Outsiders. And before we return to the service, please read with me the following quotes. If you are afraid of hospitality, but you don't have much personal strength or personal wealth, good. Then you won't intimidate anybody. You will depend all the more on God's grace. You will look all the more to the work of Christ and not your own work, and what a blessing people will get in your simple home or little apartment. Hospitality is making your guests feel like they're at home, even if you wish they were. Engaging in radically ordinary hospitality means we provide the time necessary to build strong relationships with people who think differently than we do, as well as build strong relationships from within the family of God. Some theologians go so far as to state that the growth in the earliest churches was wholly dependent on the meals and hospitality of the believers. When the spirit of hospitality dies, the heart becomes palsied with selfishness. Now let's return to the service. Good morning, church family. Our scripture this morning is taken from Luke 14, verse 7 through 11. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. possible that you noticed in the bulletin that the title of today's sermon is Flouting Etiquette. Flouting, in other words, pushing back against, spurning, wanting nothing to do with etiquette. Now, it's not as though I'm trying to push us in the direction of an even less civil society, But it is an important concept. In fact, this week I thought, well, if you're going to flout etiquette, you have to know what etiquette is, right? And so I went online and tried to find some rules of etiquette, took some quizzes on etiquette, and realized I know nothing when it comes to etiquette. I'm in real trouble. And so I thought, well, maybe I should share the joy. And so I'm going to do a little quiz this morning, and I need two volunteers. This, by the way, has not been arranged ahead of time. And so by the end of this, I'm going to have two less friends than I had at the beginning. But anyway, uh, two, two volunteers like, say, uh, Donovan Krauss there. Donovan, where did I see Donovan over here? There he is right there. Donovan, come on, come on up, Donovan. Um, <laughs> Donovan's very eager to get up here. And um, Madeline Mace, you, you, come, you come on up. So Donovan, you come stand right over here. And... Uh, Good to see you again. I didn't know you were in town. Uh, Now I do. I shouldn't have come then. (laughs) (laughs) Madeline, you come right. You got okay. Now I'm going to ask you all to step out here to the edge because I don't want anybody looking over my shoulder here as I read these questions. So there, there are seven questions. All right, and we're going to find out how well you know etiquette. Now here's the thing: if you're not sure this side of the congregation is yours, Donovan. You can ask them to raise their hands what they think. Madeline, this side of the congregation is yours. Fair enough? So some of these are multiple choice. Some of them are true or false. So the first is a multiple choice. So you got to let me get all three of them out. So when is the most gracious time to respond to an invitation? In other words, to send your RSVP. One, within 24 hours. Two, within one week. Three, any time before the respond by date. So, Donovan, when is the best? So first, 24 hours, two, one week, third, respond by date. Will you tell me your... You ought to put your mic up there. Will you tell me your score first before I answer? <laughs> I'll tell you in a minute. 
I'm going to say 24 hours. 24 hours. All right. Madeline? Any time before the Before the respond the by day. Very good. That's absolutely wrong. Donovan, you are right. So, Madeline, no pressure, but Donovan's one up on you here. All right. Number two. From which direction should you approach your dining table chair in order to sit down? Okay, so you got the picture. It's Sabbath lunch, and you're coming up to the dining table. From which direction do you approach the chair? From the left, from the right, or either direction? Madeline, you're first this time. If you're not sure, we can ask congregation. Or maybe you're sure. I, I'm going to guess left. From the left. From All right, left. very good. Donovan? I would guess left as well. Wow, you're both correct. All right, so it's two to one here. Number three, this is true or false, so this one is simple, true or false. You should always pass both the salt and the pepper, even if only one was requested. True or false? Donovan? False. False. Madeline? False. False. That's true. So today, when somebody asks for the salt, send them both. Okay, so we're still two to one. Is that right? Roger, is that right? You're helping me keep track here. All right, number four. If there are two forks on the table, you should start using the fork nearest your plate. This is true or false. If there are two forks on the table, you start by using the one nearest your plate. Madeline? True. True? All right. False. False. Oh. Have mercy. Donovan got that one, Madeline. Oh. So right, what is this? Is it three to one? Three to one. All right. <laughs> We're on to number five. In a formal place setting, the dessert spoon and fork are usually placed above the plate. This is a formal setting, so the dessert, spoon, and fork, or above the plate. Who went first last time? You did? I think, well, I don't know. Okay, we're going to just have you go first. True or false? Oh. Formal oh. dessert, formal setting, dessert, spoon, and fork above the plate. I'm going to say false. False. Donovan? I want some congregation response. <laughs> All right. So how many of you would say true? Let me see your hands. Raise your hand. Oh, a lot wow. of them. How many of you would say false? Well, it's pretty clear, Don, what they think. So. Well, I would agree, but I wanted them to become involved, you see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. So you're saying? True. True. All right. True is right. Yay. Have mercy. Four to one, Roger. Okay. <laughs> Madeline, we got we to get going here. All right. So... This one is also true and false. Since it is not right to waste food, we're on board, right, Madeline? We all agree with that. It is best to ask the waiter or your host for a doggy bag to take home the leftovers. True or false? Now, you can ask if you want to ask your, your people out here. I have a guess, but I would love to know. Okay, so is, it is not right to waste food. You can ask your waiter or your host for a doggy bag. How many of you say that's true? Let me see your hands out here. Oh, my goodness. How many of you say that's false? Well, that's pretty clear. So? Okay, I do. That was my guess. So, false. False. Okay, Donovan? False. False. It is false. Okay. <laughs> that would have been true if it was just your waiter. Mm. But when, it's, when you're eating over at Donovan's house, you're not supposed to say to Donovan, can I have a doggy bag? I'm going to take the rest of this home. So, so that's what made it false. All right, so we are at 5-2. Thank you, sir. This is the last one. All right, this has four options. Ready? How can a stranger to the community acquire social standing? How can a stranger to the community acquire social standing? One, go wherever their spouse goes. Two, attend fancy parties. Three, go to the hottest restaurants. Four, get an invitation to someone's house. Mm. So you want social standing, go wherever your spouse goes, attend fancy parties, go to the hottest restaurants, or get an invitation to someone's home. Madeline? What do you all, all think? All right, so which one? How many would say A, go wherever your spouse goes? Well, that's not a popular one. B, uh, what was B? I got to find out what B was here again. Um, so B was attend fancy parties. Anyone for that? Hottest restaurants, C. Wow. Either they're all asleep or okay. So get an invitation to someone's house. Oh, well, there you go. That's the one they think. So I would agree. You would agree. Donovan? How many agree with this side? <laughs> well, look at that. <laughs> okay. The same answer. All right. Same answer. That is correct. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And the final score is five to three, six to three, six to three. Madeline, you and, I <laughs> <laughs> you and I scored about the same, so he beat both of us. So 
But I, they'll, you can hand that to them. Thank you so much for coming up. Um, yes, thank them. Thank you very much. When I read through the rules of etiquette, I thought, have mercy. I don't know many of these. And so it left me a little concerned just about polite society. Uh, my wife will tell you that my favorite place is not the most formal of meals because I always feel like I'm somehow missing something or doing something wrong. But we're talking about flouting etiquette. Now, it's not that I'm asking you to do that. Actually, we'll see in a few moments that Jesus is suggesting that. But he's suggesting it in his world. So in order to understand, we have to know a little bit about the etiquette of his world, especially when it came to the table, which is exactly what these questions were about, Donovan and Madeline. How all had to do with the table or invitations to it. So I'm going to read you from, from a New Testament scholar named Clinton Arnold just one piece that sets the stage for what were the etiquette realities when it came to meals in the ancient world. So Arnold writes, Meals were important social rituals in the ancient world, and one would normally eat only with those of his or her own social class. One's place at the table was determined by social status, and the places beside the host represented the highest status. This was true both in Greco-Roman and Jewish society. Roman sources describe meals, imagine this, where guests of different social status are seated in different rooms and are even served different food and wine depending on their social rank. Imagine that. Various writers criticize such behavior as elitist. The Roman poet Marshall describes an incident where a host alone eats choice food while his guests look on. Imagine that. Tell me, what madness is this, Marshall writes, while the throng of invited guests looks on you, Cecilianus, alone devour the mushrooms. What prayer shall I make suitable to such a belly and gorge? May you eat such a mushroom as Claudius ate, that is, a poisonous one. In another humorous, pa pra another humorous passage, Marshall criticizes the different quality of food served to the guests. Since I am asked to dinner, why is not the same dinner served to me as to you? You take oysters fattened in the Lucrine Lake. I suck a mussel through a hole in the shell. You get mushrooms. I take hot funguses. You tackle turbo, but I brill. Golden with fat, a turtle dove gorges you with its bloated rump. There is set before me a magpie that has died in its cage. <laughs> Wonder how he felt. In other words, he's pushing back against the etiquette of the day, saying, I don't like this. This is not how it should be. But that's the way it was. And it's in a setting of a meal, a nice meal, that Jesus is going to suggest pushing back against etiquette, flouting etiquette. So we turn to Luke's gospel, the 14th chapter, which is where the incident is reported. So to, to set the stage in two quick ways, number one, remember we're in a series entitled Insiders and Outsiders, Christian Hospitality in a Polarized World. And then secondly, know that the immediate context here is a banquet in the home of a leading Pharisee. We can probably safely assume that it was a nice home, a very nice home, so it would have been a very nice meal. And it's as he's sitting there at this meal that Jesus gets to noticing both the guests and the host. And he has something to say to each of them. So we'll start with what Jesus has to say to the guests. Luke 14, we start in verse 7. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So Jesus is watching. I don't know if it was evident. People are literally elbowing their way, pushing other people out of the way, trying to get to the best places. Or if it was much more subtle. Go, 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 go. Yeah. 
you know, trying to get it, trying to get the best place. I don't know what it was, but what is clear that as Jesus watches, he sees what's going on. In other words, the rules of etiquette about which place you set in were, friends, basically the etiquette of the jungle. Whoever gets there first, beat the others to it, push them back, get in there. You claim it for your own. It had to do with selfishness. I got to get that place. And Jesus watches that. And then he says, let me tell you something. Let me talk with you about what I have seen here. It's an important statement that he's about to make. Because he tells them, don't choose the highest place, the best place. Choose the lowest place. Now, honestly, the ways in which social status are made manifest are probably quite different in his world than in ours. Though there might be some crossover. Probably quite different. We have our ways of showing social status, though, right? We show it by what we hang on the walls of our offices, what we park in the driveways of our homes, how we show people what time it is. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, we show it in many different ways. They showed it in this way. They're fighting for the best seat next to the host. And Jesus says, don't do that because, do you notice what the reason he gave? So he says, you, you've chosen that seat next to the host, and then in front of everybody, the host comes to you and says, listen, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry to do this to you, but a, a friend of mine just came. Yeah, he's the, he's the chief of OB up at the hospital. Yeah, he, he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, Megan is her name, yeah. So, so he, he's come. I need, I need this seat. Uh, could you go, j- just see that seat right back there? Yeah, by the kitchen, that seat right there. No, 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 to the left of the trash cans. Yeah, right there. Right. Could you go sit back there? Uh, Kevin, come sit here. Wow. That would be humiliating in our world. But it was more than just humiliating in their world. Listen one more time to Clinton Arnold as he describes the cultural context of such a reality. Arnold writes, honor and shame were pivotal values in the ancient Mediterranean world. A family's honor in the community determined whom they could marry, what functions they could attend, where they could live, and with whom they could do business. The public shame of moving from the first seat to the last in front of one's colleagues would be a humiliation almost worse than death. This wasn't just changing seats. Suddenly the options for whom you're Son or your daughter was going to marry, shifted. Suddenly where you could do business opened up or shut down. Suddenly the people with whom you could relate, what functions you could attend, either appeared or disappeared. This affected your life. No wonder people are fighting. Kind of the survival of the fittest, the law of the jungle, that's our etiquette. We're getting there if it kills us. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to act according to the etiquette of humility. Humility. You never get anywhere in the world doing things with humility. I mean, honestly, friends, we tend to, not always and not in every setting, but we tend to value humility in our world at least much more so than would have happened in the ancient world. It was not viewed as a virtue, something to be desired. It was viewed as weakness. Weakness. And yet Jesus is saying, this is the basis on which I want you to make these choices. Can you imagine if I stood up here, one of the pastors stood up here and said, okay, we have a new ethic. We want you to make your choices based on weakness. Just be weak. Just choose whatever you choose because you're weak. You would say, what? That's crazy. And yet Jesus in that world says, make the humble choice. But the way he states the exchange of chairs underlines just how deceitful the human ego can be. 
If you haven't done the work of humility before God in your heart before you take this action, the the ego will trick you. The late Fred Craddock put it this way. He said, once this has set in, once people figured out what Jesus was saying, then there was a rush for the lowest seat. Everybody elbowing each other out of the way to get in the lowest seat with their ears cocked to hear their name being called up to the higher seat. That would be even a greater honor. So if you haven't dealt with ego, it doesn't matter whether you go here or there, it's still going to be a problem. What Jesus ultimately calls us to is humility. Choosing the lower place. I wonder how that would affect us in our relationships with others whether it be around the table, around the office, around the neighborhood, around the gym. The ethic, the etiquette of humility as Jesus pushes back against this ethic, against this etiquette that demands me first. So that's what he says to the guests. But now he has something to say to the host. And what he says to the host drives us straight into the target area of Christian hospitality. So back to Luke, the 14th chapter, this time starting in verse 12. Luke writes, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So Jesus is saying something that may be a bit hard to take in right here. Eugene Peterson helps us with it in his paraphrase of the message, capturing what I think is the essence of what Jesus is saying in the first part. He says, Jesus says, do not merely invite your family, your friends, your neighbors, etc. Not merely. It's not that Jesus is necessarily against family dinners. But that's entertaining. What Jesus is wanting to talk about here is hospitality. Do not merely invite them, or they may repay you. He's addressing this, this social quid pro quo. You do for me, I'll do for you. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You know, uh, the Smiths had us over recently. We've got to have them over. And it's this social exchange that happens mostly when you're on an equal par, an equal level. You're all part of the in-group. That's fine as far as entertaining goes. But Jesus is driving us toward hospitality. And so he says, rather than focusing there... And then he says in verse 13, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. If, if, if all Jesus is saying is look for those who have been pushed to the fringes, who have been denied marginalized, those who have been beaten down by the circumstances they have faced into the quagmire of life and draw them in, if that's all he's saying, that would be enough. Because it would move us out of our comfort zones. It would push us out of our enclaves. It would drive us to draw the boundary much more widely of those who were outsiders but now experience the treatment of insiders. If that's all he's saying, that would be enough. It would be enough, we know, because over in Matthew 25, just after he has said, talked about all the signs of his coming and his return in glory, and then he says, watch, watch, watch. And we're freaking out, saying, okay, what do you mean by watch? He gives us four parables to define what he means by watch. The last one, the crowning pinnacle, is the parable called the sheep and the goats in which the king says, 
The reason I'm welcoming you here or the reason I'm not welcoming you here is based on how you treated me. And both groups say, what are you talking about? We've never even seen you. And he says, oh, yes, you did. When you did this to the least of these or didn't do it to the least of these, you did it or didn't do it for me. So we know Jesus has that in his mind. So if that's all he's saying here in this passage, that in itself would be enough. But he's saying more than that. In fact, scholar after commentary underlines what he is much more pointed about in this context. And it grew out of the theological understandings and assumptions of the day. Grew, it out, grew out of it in this sense. There was the belief that if you committed some grave sin, some grievous sin, that that sin would likely be punished in the here and now. Or the way they often thought of it was, when they saw somebody who suffered here, very poverty-stricken, blind, lame, the people he just named, when they see that, they would see not a person suffering, they would see somebody who had committed a great sin. Therefore, the assumption was not a fellow human being who is suffering, but a person who has sinned so that God has reached out and touched them. In fact, leprosy was known to be called the finger of God because they understood this to be God's punishment. Hey, I can't do anything about that. You did something to upset the man upstairs. That's between you and him, but I don't want anything to do with it. So that the ones Jesus here names are the ones who would likely have been assumed to have lived that kind of life. And who therefore now the church had no desire to enter into the religion of the day. Nothing nothing here for you. That's between you and God. And push them out. In fact, listen. Craig Evans, New Testament scholar, writes, The advice he gave would have sounded quite strange to the ears of Jesus' contemporaries. To their way of thinking, the poor, the crippled, the lamed, and the blind are those from whom God has withheld his blessing. In all likelihood, it was thought that their afflictions were the result of sin. These people, along with the Gentiles, would be the last people to enter the kingdom of God. Why should anyone invite them to a feast? To eat with such people could result in religious defilement. Don't forget that sentence. To eat with such people could result in religious defilement. You know, my mother said, birds of a feather flock together. If you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. I don't want to be with that kind of people. It could result in religious defilement. Therefore, the pious Israelite would quite naturally desire table fellowship with others of similar piety. Jesus, however, does not share this narrow self-righteous view. His proclamation of the good news declares that even the lowly and outcast may be included in the kingdom of God. Nowhere is this idea seen more vividly than in this passage. These are people the religion of the day wanted no part of, pushed out. These are the people that Jesus says, invite them to your table. No wonder Fred Craddock once said, tell me who sits at your table and I'll tell you who you are. Invite them to the table. It's clear that he's not driving at entertaining, as good as that may be in all kinds of contexts. But that invites friends and family and the good and the lovely and the people we connect easily with and those that aren't going to challenge us. That's entertaining. That's wonderful as far as it goes. Jesus is talking about Christian hospitality. Christian hospitality is extending the invitation to the unworthy. It's including the less than favorable. It's drawing in those who have been shut out. Christian hospitality. That challenges me on a deep level. So here, I don't know, a week or two ago, <clears throat> Michael Brownfield, member of our community here, sent me, thank you, Michael, sent me a story. 
in a book he was reading by Kyle Eidelman. I've read Eidelman before, but I had not read this book. Michael said I could share this with you. I want to read you in Eidelman's own words the story. He writes, I once met a man named Adam. I want to tell you about Adam, but before I do, I want to ask you to consider Titus 2, 11 to 14. Titus 2, Paul's letter to Titus. So it can be a rather hard, hard-hitting letter, including even this passage. Listen to Titus 2, starting in verse 11. For the grace of God has, appears, that has, has appeared that offers salvation to all people. That's wonderful. The grace of God has appears, appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So Paul says, God's grace has appears that has saved all of us. But then he goes on to talk about growth and transformation and change. Back to Eidelman's words. We're told it's the grace of God that offers salvation. You probably already knew that. But did you also notice, Eidelman asks, that it's God's grace, not fear of God's wrath, that teaches people to say no to ungodliness and leads them to want to live good lives for Jesus? Did you know that? It seems grace is the key to everything. So, Adam. He told me he had been incarcerated and that he was illiterate when he went to prison. But another inmate who was a follower of Jesus realized Adam was illiterate. He told Adam he would teach him to read and write by using the Gospel of Mark. By the time he was released, Adam had not only learned to read about Jesus, but had become a follower of Jesus. When he got out, he began attending a small church in a small town. I didn't know what the crime, what crime put Adam in prison, but somehow the people in the church found out. Some were upset that he was now at their church. One longtime prominent family told the pastor, Hey, look, you either ask Adam to leave or we're leaving. The pastor explained that Adam was welcome at their church. The family left. It began to look like other families were going to follow. Adam told me he started thinking it might be best for him to leave. He didn't want to create division or make a bigger mess for the pastor to have to clean up. Then one week after the sermon, the pastor stood before the congregation and asked Adam to come up front. Adam knew what was about to happen. The pastor must have found out about his crimes. He was going to tell everyone and ask Adam to leave. Adam made his way to the front with his head down, ashamed of what he had done and embarrassed for what was about to happen. When he was standing with the pastor, the pastor announced, I want everyone to know that I've made an important decision. Since Adam has been released from prison, he's had a hard time finding work, so I want to offer him a job helping take care of our church facilities. The pastor reached into his pocket and pulled out an extra set of keys to the church. He gave them to Adam and said, you're going to be needing these to open and close the church each week. Tears ran down Adam's cheeks as he told me the story. He paused, collecting himself, then said, it was the first time in my life I'd had a key to anything. For the first time, he felt truly loved and accepted. Oh, I should have mentioned where I met Adam. I was speaking not at a prison, but at a pastor's conference. But why did I meet Adam there? Because he's been a pastor at that church for the past six years. That's what happens when people, one at a time, experience the love and grace of Jesus through his followers. Or I might add, when they experience Christian hospitality through his followers. Entertaining is wonderful as far as it goes. But in this scene, Jesus is not talking about entertaining. He's talking about hospitality. He's talking about making outsiders feel like insiders. He's talking about drawing to our tables, to our relationships, to our embrace, people that have typically been pushed out, ignored, and shunned. He's saying invite those. 
invite them to the table. My wife and I love having our kids over, kids and their spouses. You know who else we love to have over? The other ones we love to have over are the kids that our kids love. We love that. Just struck me. We, and not just Anita and me, but we love to have Jesus over. Love to have him in our homes. You know what Jesus likes? He likes to bring with him the people he loves. Not people who are projects. Not people who are trying to ourselves change. Because remember, if they need to be judged, God will handle it. If they need to be saved, Jesus has got it. If they need conviction, the Holy Spirit will take care of it. He's just saying to us, invite them. I'm there with you. Invite them. And then just turn me loose in their lives. <laughs> you have no idea what can then happen. So I wonder, who's the person in my life? Who's the person in your life this week that needs to be invited to the table? Jesus tells us, flout etiquette. And instead, in humility, draw in those who could never otherwise be there. Gracious God, we thank you. We're actually in awe when we truly pause to consider the fact that incredibly we're at the table. Lord, let it never stop there. Push us outward to open to others the door to the supper table of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to remain and ponder whom you might invite as we hear the post loop.
Hello, everybody. So glad to be with you. I am delighted I get to be in the Loma Linda University Church Media Center to do the recording today. And Zach is over there to make things work so well. So God bless. And we'll bring you greetings now. Hello, David Holland. Dr. Holland, do you remember the trip we were on? Lots of fun that time. There you are in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm so glad to greet you for your birthday. Your daughter reminds me this is the time. All the very best. Sybil Kyle, Darby, Montana, 96th birthday lady. Warmest congratulations to you. And I see you a couple of times and with a little baby. Congratulations. Susan Sisk Kuykendall, also Las Vegas, Nevada. Lady, you are 100 years old, I'm told. Warmest congratulations and all the best to that family you're with there now. Julie Herbottle, South Dakota. Hello there, so glad to greet you for your birthday. Wish you all the best and there you get to snuggle in with family also. Hello, Earl Thorpe, College Place, Washington. Another 100th birthday. Warmest congratulations to you, sir, and I wish all the best to you with your wife, and looks like you're a flying man. Keru Malate, Linwood, Washington, six years old. Look at this lady. Congratulations, dear. So glad to see you in snow and then at the beach and with your family. Margie Yanez. Hello, Margie. Wow, I was so glad to know you're having another birthday, and I'm here to wish you the very best. And that goes for you too, Diana Moore, up there in Sutherland, Oregon. Glad to talk to you the other day, and to know that you're with your classroom at the church school in Sutherland. Hello, Wesley Kime, at the Villa. Dr. Kime, I extend to you warmest congratulations on your birthday, and that goes for you too, Rita Bailey, and glad to see you also with your son, Randy Norton. Ingrid Nelson, also part of the Villa family, happy birthday to you, lady, and that goes for you too, Elia Liu, also a part of the Villa family. Russell Tracy, at the Villa as well. I'm telling you folks, we've got quite a family there, and I wish you a happy birthday, Russell, and I wish you, Helmuth Kuhn, also at the Villa, a happy birthday. Hello, Joanna Hartnell. So glad to be in touch with you. Thank you for what you do for children's ministry at the church. There with handsome Jonathan and those two handsome sons of yours. Congratulations on your birthday, Joanna. Darlene Waybright, Battleground, Washington. Darlene, we're always glad to hear from you. And now I get to say happy birthday, Darlene. Tim Windemuth, also got to talk to you a few days ago up there, Medical Lake, Washington. 73rd birthday, there you are with dear Sherry. And at the lodge where you celebrated, at 73, you haven't got sense enough yet to put long pants on in the snow, do you? Anyway, congratulations, Tim. Catherine Lewis, over in Charlotte, North Carolina. Happy birthday, Catherine, and so glad to see you with my pastor friend, Leslie. Jim Robertson, Happy Valley, Oregon. Happy birthday to you, Jim. There with wife Vivian, and I love this picture of you and your daughter, Daisy May. Victor Ware, right here, Loma Linda. So glad to know it's about, it's about your birthday, Victor. Happy birthday, glad to see you with dear Shelley, and I love this picture with your sons. Cindy DePinto, Silver Spring, Maryland. Hello, Cindy. Happy birthday, and glad to see you with Maitland. Betty McMurray, Boring, Oregon. Hi, Betty, congratulations on your birthday and on being a grandma. And there you are with brother Jim and the rest of the grandchildren. Gladys Mitchell, right here, Loma Linda. Happy birthday, dear Gladys. You're 98, I think. And then I get to see you with Dr. Bob. Congratulations. Ed Boyot, Riverside, California. Hi, Ed. Happy birthday. And glad to see you with Terry. And Keith Mack, Dr. Mack, down San Diego way. Happy birthday to you, man. 
author now, I'm told, and then with wife Sherry. Bob Kasky, Colorado Springs. Hi, Bob. Proud truck man. And then with Marilyn. Narcissa Meekoff, New York. Congratulations on your birthday, Narcissa. Glad to see you with Nikki. And then with Paul and the canine member of your family. And finally, Lori and Lloyd Westcott, Portland, Oregon. Listen, folks, 74th anniversary. And see this montage of who they are and where they go. Well, that's us one more time. So glad to be with you. I have so much for which to be thankful. And that includes all of you, too.